Um, I became interested in neuroeconomics as an extension of behavioral economics, which is the idea of trying to use psychology to, to make a more realistic economic model with bit more better practical implications. The behavioral economics frontier is going in two directions, I would say. One is out toward field data and trying to see beyond the laboratory, you know, how managers and customers actually are influenced by framing and psychology and emotion. And the other is, what is the brain actually doing when people are buying something or trading a stock or making a complicated strategic decision? So our approach has been to say, um, what exactly is going on in brains when people are buying and selling things during a bubble and a crash? During the rise in a bubble, um, people often become convinced that basic economic principles no longer hold. And when the crashes occur, you often get you know, a combination of kind of panic, um, sort of waking up, uh, fear, and um, we were interested in whether there would be neural correlates of something like greed or irrational exuberance uh, is a term that Bob Schiller coined, as well as something like an early warning signal of when it, you know, a crash might occur. And one reason we turned to the neuroscience was if you have a time path of stocks and it just keeps going up and up and up, it's really tough to tell when something that's been going up is going to start to turn and go down. And so maybe in the brains of some of the traders, there's something like a warning signal saying, oh, I know prices are still going up, but they're going to go down soon. And we might be able to find a kind of a predictor, a neural predictor of crashes. There are two useful things you could do if you understood a lot more about the kind of underlying biology and brain activity in bubbles. Um, one is that you might be able to say, you know, there's something, there's an anxiety in the market or a restlessness or a fear signal or an uncertainty signal that, that may pretend um, a, a coming crash. Probably we'll never be able to do that really accurately. The second thing we'd like to be able to do is a little deeper in terms of neuroscience and also more practical implication is to really understand the interplay of brain regions and kind of feedback signals to really you know, be able to say eventually someday, for example, if we can stimulate a certain part of the brain, can we create bubbles? If we can stimulate another part of the brain, can we precipitate crashes so that you get kind of a soft landing where the, you know, rather than having a dramatic crash in housing, there's just a, you know, a, a, a gradual slowdown of prices, which is often in a macroeconomic way, a better thing. From an ethical point of view also, we're concerned that, that we, we typically see practical applications like in health, as with, for example, behavioral genetics. You know, if we, if we found genes that predispose people to some kind of weakness, um, you know, do you want companies to be able to find out about them and tempt those people into bad behavior? My view is that, that neuroscientists shouldn't be able to and really are not well equipped to decide by ourselves about how to manage ethical implications and to, to, to be sure the science is used for good and not evil. It'll require a kind of social consensus. Uh, the philosophers have really thought long and hard about this. There's technical issues about law and you know, just what society uh, thinks is reasonable to do. 